Okay, so yeah, this is, um, I guess this is work that came out of a visit with Sebastian Reich at the University of Potsdam uh, earlier this year, like directly before coronavirus hit Europe. So it was, a, it was an interesting time. Um, but yeah, the idea is, okay, so let's imagine that we've got some uh, low dimensional manifold, um, which we'll call D, um, that we would like to do some sort of numerics perhaps on, you know, perhaps like explore it, um, I mean, you know, visualize it or um, do some kind of um, reductions on it or yeah, even like solve PDEs. Uh, however, the problem that we might have is that we don't necessarily know this manifold explicitly, but we just have been given some sample of data from it. Uh, sort of perhaps a classic example of this is we get something from a dynamical attraction, the attractor, um, so, or some statistical data that we've sort of gone out into the world and found, uh, or maybe something from some kind of imaging data where you just get some points. Uh, you, we don't, we can't necessarily connect these. Um, yeah, we, we don't, we don't have a manifold uh, that we can actually get stuff from. We just have this data. Uh, another complication we might have with this sort of problem is that this data is embedded in a, like an ambient space, a very high dimension. Uh, so you can imagine, say, if you're looking at a limit cycle of a PDE, uh, you have an infinite dimensional ambient space, but some um, you know, something, some finite dimensional object that you want to look at. Uh, and perhaps this object is quite twisted. It's quite, um, you know, it's not embedded in a very nice linear way in this high dimensional space. So you can't just use principal component analysis. Uh, but I mean, as we said, we want to do all this stuff um, uh, with our manifold, uh, a sort of classic way that we, so we want to do it in a way that's kind of independent of the embedding or at least independent of the way the embedding works globally. We just want to sort of build it out of kind of local information. And the good way to do that is by considering a sort of Laplacian uh, on the manifold, or I guess more generally like a Laplace Beltrami operator, um, which is weighted by some, which we will, will allow to potentially be weighted by some function P. Uh, so the form of that looks a bit like this, and we've got to put a one half normalization in everywhere uh, because that's very SDE-ish. Um, but essentially what it looks like is a diffusion, on the manifold plus a sort of drift term, that shouldn't be a log phi, that should just be grad phi, um, plus a drift term, which sort of essentially pushes you in the direction of higher P. Um, yeah, so, I mean, essentially what this operator does is it generates an SDE, uh, which is a diffusion plus a drift term. So that's sort of maybe how you should think of it, but of course it's a generator, so it's, um, I mean, it's the adjoint of the fokker planck equation. Um, one, I mean, of course, there's a sort of disjunction here because we're thinking about um, this kind of local, like this very smooth operator, uh, you know, a, a second order um, differential operator, but we want to deal with, we we're dealing with these points, the sort of random sample of points, so that's very not a smooth object. Uh, and the idea of diffusion maps is it is essentially to connect the two uh, in a, nice way. So the way we like to think about it in diffusion maps, I mean, there's a few ways you can think about it. You can sort of talk about graph Laplacians, but the way I'm going to talk about it here is thinking about approximating the semi-group of the operator. So that's, um, I mean, e to the epsilon l for some small time step epsilon. That's basically just the transition kernel of, um, of the, or like the evolution operator from zero to time, time zero to time epsilon of uh, this, yeah, of this Laplace operator. Uh, and it's essentially that you can think of it as like a transition kernel of a biased random walk uh, where the bias is towards higher P. Uh, the way we're going to approximate this semi-group is on by essentially <laughs> constructing a biased random walk on the data uh, that appropriately will converge to the biased random walk on this manifold, given my e to the epsilon L. The way we, I guess, so the way we're going to construct a biased random walk is by starting with something that looks a bit like a random walk. Uh, so we're going to start with a kernel matrix, uh, K, which basically um, contains, uh, it's going to be a matrix that uh, like acts on the data points. So it's going to be an M by M matrix, which is obviously very big, but uh, numerically you tend to make it so that it's sparse or, I mean, yeah, essentially that it's sparse. So in what we're going to do is we, going to take, for, for each pair of points, i and j, x, i and x, j, you take the distance between them and you apply a Gaussian kernel to it, a uh, variance epsilon, so that's um, two, that's, I guess, standard deviation squared epsilon, which matches the time step, 
shouldn't point at my screen, uh, which matches the time step um, of the semi-group. Uh, and so you can imagine like what this is sort of kind of telling us is that is going to tell us is that the chance of hopping from in this kind of biased random walk from point xi to point xj is somehow going to be quite large if you're within square root epsilon of your um, if they're within square root epsilon of each other but if they're far away from each other then it's going to be exponentially perhaps zero but you, you sort of have this hop but again we need to make sure that it's kind of biased in the right way so we have this nice weighting uh, and in fact just the well and um, so the way we're going to do that is we're going to create a weight vector u. Um, we're going to decide on it, uh, and that will that will tell us what our in fact that will tell us what our p is that we converge to. Um, and you can think about larger values of u being preferent like points that are sort of preferentially uh, that that will be like kind of preferred compared to what happens if you didn't normalize you know if you didn't multiply by u. Uh, on the other hand, um, so that, so we're going to multiply on k on the right by that, but then we also need to normalize our matrix in a sort of slightly different way so that it's a Markov matrix, so that it in fact can be think of the transition kernel of a stochastic process uh, by another vector v, which is just, I guess, um, well, the, precisely the vector you need to make your matrix Markov, and we're going to denote this kind of new multiple, like kind of weighted matrix by p, so it's kind of like a, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's, a, it's, a, Markov, it's a stochastic matrix. Um, and I mean, so I guess if you want to think about what this normalization actually does, sort of quali yeah, kind of qualitatively maybe. Um, the invariant measure of the sort of process generated by this stochastic matrix is just uh, u over v. Uh, so that kind of looks a bit like, for reasons that will become apparent later, um, it looks a bit like like the density rho times u squared, um, which is what we want to converge to our p. Uh, so in terms of, I mean, yeah, like the choice of u, um, the kind of standard way, standard choices of weights that you might do, there's a variety of them, but essentially they all come down to one parameter family, uh, which essentially powers the kernel density estimates of the sampling density row on the measure. So essentially, I guess you just take a, um, and it turns out that um, if you just, I mean, you just, to do a kernel density estimate, you essentially take all your points and you, um, add up the sort of the kernel, um, this kind of kernel, uh, some of them you, you take, I guess you take a mean of them. Uh, there should be, in fact, sorry, I missed a one on M here uh, in this, in this the definition of K. So, and so this, so this K1 is just a kernel density estimate of rho. And then we take the power of minus alpha and it converges to a, um, like you, you, the kind of convergence to a semi-group you get will be to the semi-group of this um, of these kinds of Laplace algebraic operators. So they have a gradient term that is proportional um, to the density on the measure. So I mean, there's the interesting ones out of this set are well, I guess alpha equals zero, which is just when you set u to be equal to one, and this is I guess the standard graph Laplacian, uh, and it. I mean, the, set, the SDE that it converges to isn't super meaningful, but that's what it is, and people like to study this one a lot. Um, uh, alpha equals a half is, in fact, will give you the Langevin uh, diffusion on rho. So that's uh, essentially uh, the diffusion that um, preserves the preserves the sample measure rho. Um, so I mean, if you want to sort of construct, so people like to do use these. Um, for example, to sort of sample, like sample measures, construct random walks on your measure that preserves this sample measure. Um, and then alpha equals one is just the kind of standard diffusion that removes all dependence on this sample measure row on the manifold. Um, and so you sort of, yeah, I mean, you get your standard Laplace Beltrami operator where you can think about, well, what is the, you're hearing the shape of the drum, that kind of deal. Um, of course, this is just like one possible way to choose this normalization. Uh, and in fact, we, there are other ways you can do it. And in fact, although no one really talks about them, but um, we're gonna talk about and introduce um, a sort of weight normalization based on synchron weights later, which in fact is a very, a sort of kind of better way to deal with this alpha talk equals one and a half case, uh, as well as being a nice illustration of the kinds of power, like the, the methods that, the theoretical methods that we're gonna introduce a bit later. So, um, I guess you can ask, well, like, what do we, why do we care about Laplace Beltrami operators? Like, what can we actually get out of them? Uh, that's kind of practically relevant if you're not interested in um, 
specifically interested in them. Um, sorry, I'm just going to go. Okay. Uh, right. So, I mean, the reason that I guess Kaufman kind of introduced the sort of diffusion maps algorithm back in 2006 really comes out of the fact that the eigenfunctions of, um, well, really any kind of Markov operator, uh, but specifically these um, kind of diffusion operators. Uh, will define quite nice, like very smooth intrinsic coordinates on the, on the actual manifold um, or on your sample uh, that in fact will, uh, and, and if you sort of represent your, like plot your manifold in these um, intrinsic coordinates, it will actually preserve a kind of distance on the manifold. Um, and so in particular, you can use this for kind of dimension reduction. So if you have your D in a massive, in a very high dimensional space, or perhaps non-linearly in a kind of weird way embedded in a low dimensional space. Um, so for example, in this sort of very classic example of a Swiss roll where you have a sort of curly manifold and you take some, eigen, you find some eigenfunctions of it. And if you pick the right eigenfunctions, you will get some very nice coordinates. So if you look at, I mean, if you look at these two different eigenfunctions, you can see that they together will form a nice two-dimensional representation of this, I mean, two-dimensional manifold living in a three-dimensional space. So you can plot it out as a flat thing and um, do what you want with it in that flat space. And indeed, if you use diffusion maps, you can see that you get the same coordinates out. So the, um, the diffusion maps to approximate coordinates will, like the, 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 the sort of kind of discretized um, the coordinates obtained using this kind of database discretization will approximate the true coordinates. And you can, again, get out, you know, you can, you can sort of plot your data points in a sort of reduced space. Um, as I said, also, you can use these kinds of like sort of database discretizations to do things like mesh-free PDE solving, which people have been sort of getting interested in. And you can also, you can actually also use the kind of eigenfunctions you get out. Um, so, I mean, not just using one, two, but like, you know, the first, say, 20, uh, to compress other operators um, that you might be able to represent using your data. So one thing that people have done um, is in sort of dynamical forecasting, um, taking some dynamic, using dynamical data, uh, is approximating parent Fabinius operators uh, by sort of projecting them onto the highest um, eigenfunctions of this Laplacian approximation. Uh, and this is, supposedly a very efficient way to do it. Um, so then we can ask, I mean, the point of this talk really is to talk about the kind of theoretical um, convergence of these results. Uh, and I suppose the convergence has two parts, which you, and because you have this extra, you have, I mean, essentially because you have two parameters you need to think about. Uh, you have the size of your sample, um, M, so it's the num number of points you have, uh, but you also have this time step parameter epsilon. Uh, and you need to make sure that your epsilon is not too big or not too small, otherwise you will in different ways run into trouble. Um, the kind of parameter you, or the kind of number that you really want to think about when you deal with this is a sort of, well, let's call it MF, the, the effective number of points that, you, that um, your kernel will actually see when it samples. So uh, this is on this right hand side, you can see that, um, if you take, if you have some point in the center of the circle uh, and you apply your, and, and you sort of want to um, think about your kernel matrix, um, K, or even like your sort of reweighted kernel matrix P, um, because you have a Gaussian um, or really any kind of, any sort of kind of kernel um, whose bandwidth is sort of about square root of epsilon, it's only going to see points within a sort of, you know, root epsilon ball. Of, um, of itself. So the number of, the number of points that it's actually sampling over, that you're effectively sampling over is something like order M times epsilon to the D on two. And so you need this number to not get too, to not be small essentially to get some sort of convergence. Um, so uh, yeah, so essentially if you want your weighted matrix, if you want your matrix to kind of converge to the semi-group in a sensible way, you need something like MF times epsilon to the power, like some small power uh, to converge to infinity. And you also need epsilon going to zero because you have essentially two different kinds of errors associated with the two 
um, well, the two parameters, but you could also think about it as the two different kinds of di um, discretizations that are going on, uh, because you're discretizing in time and you're discretizing in space. And so with the space discretization, you have a kind of a stochastic um, uh, so-called variance error, because it's, I mean, it's stochastic, um, where you have this sort of finite rank operator, which we'll talk about, but it's basically the weight through matrix P, um, uh, which is, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's a sort of random sample. Um, it's kind of, it, it's based on your sample, but as you take your sample, if you take your sample to infinity, it will converge to some sort of um, deterministic continuum, sort of spatial continuum limit, um, which looks like a kernel operator, um, but then you still have this kind of time step uh, and there is a sort of then a bias error um, as you take your time step to zero so that I, I suppose this weighted kernel operator converges to the semi-group um, in, a, in a way that sort of is useful and makes sense. Um, so, and that's, that's, I guess, the sort of time discretization um, part of it. And yeah, so I mean, you, you, you need to make sure that it, like in practice, that you make sure that they kind of converge to zero together. Um, and um, yeah, you, you need to sort of treat these two components a little bit separately because theoretically they do behave rather differently. Um, okay, so that's the kind of framework, I guess, for thinking about the theoretical, like yeah, the kind of convergence uh, rates of it. Um, so in terms of the results that people that actually exist, um, so the sort of kind of pointwise error bounds are quite well known. So when I say pointwise, I mean, you take a specific function and you apply your, um, so this PM epsilon, which is just, I mean, essentially a functional representation of your weighted matrix. Um, the error between that and um, your semi-group applied to a given function at a given point is kind of well known. Uh, the bias error you can sort of, uh, is, is a kind of, I mean, you, you look at your kernel a bit and maybe you, in this case, Singer could apply a symmetry argument and you can show that it's order epsilon squared. Um, and furthermore, I mean, if your, if your matrix U doesn't depend on so if, if you're if you're if you're normalizing um, function, your 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 sorry your weight vector uh, doesn't depend on your sample, um, then it's your variance error is also very is is quite easy to compute. It's really just a, a central limit theorem estimate. Um, we'll see that we'll see that a little bit later. Uh, but essentially, this is where this MF comes in. The error between the kind of variance error is essentially just a central limit theorem in this MF. Um, components. So very nice. This has all been known for, you know, like 15 years. Um, spatial convergence, and that's, and that's about the optimal, the optimal results that you're going to get out of that. Um, spatial convergence rates um, have been rather harder to come by though. Um, so we do, like intuitively, you do expect that the point rise convergence rates will sort of more or less hold for the spectral data. Although the time step, because you have your approximating e to the epsilon l, which is very close to the identity, um, uh, you expect to kind of the pointwise error to be kind of magnified by an order of epsilon to the minus one compared for this. Um, so for bias error, for example, you expect order epsilon instead of order epsilon squared. But what people just tend to do in the literature for some reason um, is to just look at a sort of very naive estimate where you're just saying L squared to L squared, L2 to L2, uh, where you get an order epsilon to the one half kind of deal. Um, And variance error estimates are sort of a bit all over the place. Um, the kind of way that most people have looked at it uh, over time is by looking at the same, I mean, essentially compact embedding estimates um, where you look at, say, you, you assume that you're applying it to a, well, we'll, we'll see, you, you, you apply it to a given function. So you, you, you're applying a central limit theorem to not just a single function, but to a class of functions, uh, which have some compact embedding behavior. Um, this is good for establishing qualitative convergence, um, but the kind of rates that people have tended to get out of this have not been very good. So for example, um, in 2015, she looked at it and showed the variance error was order um, MF to the minus a half, which is what you expect, but then has this sort of horrible huge term in epsilon, um, 
that essentially, yeah, comes out of kind of poor embedding of these class, like poor, poor compact embedding rates, essentially. Um, a very different way people have been looking at it is using kind of optimal transport results. So essentially by constructing a coupling between the empirical measure of your, of your XIs uh, with the actual measure of the rows, like the kind of limiting measure of the rows. Um, and there they found that you got a sort of optimal transport. So you got Nick Garcia Trillis and, and various other people found that you got um, an optimal transport rate of um, uh, MF to the minus one on D, which is, I mean, the standard, like one minus MF to the one, on, the M to the minus one on D is a very standard um, optimal transport kind of convergence rate. And obviously for high dimensions, it's a lot slower than um, the central limit theorem rate. Yes, so I mean, this holds for D greater than two. Um, however, I mean, it, it, it's, it's something, um, and it gets broadly the right kind of scaling between M and Epsilon. Um, they then later, um, people, um, sort of more recently, I mean, slightly more recently, obviously, um, they've sort of bootstrapped off that um, by essentially applying the central, like showing that these estimates are sort of reasonably okay, and then applying the central limit theorem uh, to kind of Rayleigh quotients because these are all, um, uh, these are all self-adjoint operators, so you can sort of compute eigenvectors and so on using Rayleigh quotients, um, eigen, eigenvalues, um, to show that it's, uh, Right, to, to sort of get this kind of central limit theorem point-wise estimate results. Uh, they could actually, it, this is actually kind of only worked in a quite limited area because they were just use, essentially not even really diffusion maps, just completely unweighted uh, graph Laplace. And so it's like you take your K matrix uh, and you look at the spectral data of that. Um, and perhaps the reason for this is that you can't, they, they could, you can't kind of recursively imply, apply the central limit theorem. Um, or at least it's you, know, you need to do some sort of slightly something slightly different. Um, and in general, um, yeah. So it, it becomes harder uh, if you want to sort of apply a like you know every, apply a central limit theorem to something where you've already taken your random uh, matrix. So kind of what this um, talk is going to be about uh, is well. And the rest of this talk is going to be about like showing them the kind of thinking about how can we make the, these kind of pointwise rates hold for the spectral data, but in a way that's very flexible, so that uh, if you if you want to sort of think about some kind of complex nonlinear problem or kind of recursively apply your um, your kind of data discretization to itself a lot, how can you make that work? Um, how can you get good theoretical estimates on this? So. Um, so I guess in the rest of the talk, of which there is probably not that much, um, we're going to talk about how you get how you get nice uh, bounds on the s on the, the variance error. Um, I guess a little bit of how you get the bias estimate. Um, so the, the bounds on the bias estimate. <laughs> Sorry, brain. Bias error. Uh, so as epsilon goes to zero, and then I'll talk about a nice kind of application where we actually get this. Uh, we use a sort of slightly different um, set of weights, which are kind of implicitly defined. Um, and in fact, have some optimal uh, behavior. And I'll just note that we're going to make our manifold a flat torus, so that's a little bit of a cheat. Um, but with essentially, I guess, an extra step in sort of computing the error, it should be able to be possible to make uh, a lot of these results work for other kinds of manifolds. Right, and I guess just to explain. Um, so, so first, I suppose we should just explain like how you can in fact interpolate a matrix or like relate a matrix to you know all these functional operators. Um, essentially, you, this the kind of um, matrix. Well, let's say the kernel matrix K. Um, if you apply it to a vector that contains sort of function values, it essentially computes a certain operator of this K M epsilon uh, at the points. Um, at the function point, at the at the value points, because you can think about the, like the actual kernel, this g epsilon xi minus xj as interpolating the kernel um, at xi and x, you know, at, at, at a point xi xj, um, and this and this and this is completely faithful. So if you if you work with the km epsilon, you're working exactly with your matrix. Um, 
this gives us a really like natural way to interpolate. So we can also think about our standard, we can also write our standard weight, like our right-hand weight as a function. We can write our left-hand weight as a function. Uh, we can write then our weighted matrix as an operator. Um, and so this is how we're gonna go. So we're gonna deal with this kind of, instead of dealing with matrices and so on, we're gonna deal with operators. Um, and in particular for variance error, we're going to want to make sure that our operator will converge to some continuum limit, which I guess we should define. Um, so yeah, if we have this interpolation, um, we, we, again, we write it as a sum, uh, and we can write this sum, I guess, essentially as a composition of multiplying by the sample measure rho m. So this kind of empirical measure of the xi, you know, a bunch of like one on m sum delta xi. Uh, and then applying a convolution by a Gaussian to this, this product, uh, which will then give us a nice smooth function. Um, and clearly because we expect our um, empirical measure, our sample measure to uh, converge to the actual measure rho, um, the, our empirical measure converges to the measure rho, we get a continuum limit, which is just essentially convolution of rho times phi. Uh, and furthermore, I guess, because, I mean, if you, if you look at this, um, you can see that KM, like the kind of the expectation of KM epsilon is going to be K epsilon. Um, so certainly if we apply this, if, if, if we sort of think about the pointwise convergence, um, so of, I guess the, the, the difference between KM epsilon applied to phi evaluated at some point X minus the continuum equivalent, uh, we can just, you know, like use Chernoff bounds, standard central limit theorem ideas to get a nice um, decay bound. And here you can, you can see this MF term turning up. Uh, so yeah, this is a yeah, this probabilistic bound. We can then ask, well, okay, how do we extend this from pointwise point things to functions? Um, uh, or specifically not, I mean, you know, maybe convergence of functions in norm, but then convergence of operators in norm. Um, and the answer, right, so the way we're going to do this is kind of a bit like this Klebenko Cantelli idea um, using sort of compact uh, covering arguments. So, for example, for the function, if we want to show that the functions converge in norm, um, we can say, well, okay, well, we can cover our manifold D uh, by, say, um, about, you know, some, some number of balls of radius psi. And this, the, I mean, this number will grow polynomial in psi. Uh, so if we just allow ourselves to, we, we know that if we look, so if we just essentially apply the central limit theorem at all the centers of these balls, uh, and then sort of take a kind of union bound of this, so say, well, the maximum of the, the error over, at all these sort of midpoints of the balls is going to be, with a certain probability, going to be bounded by C, say, um, and then, um, we can then extend that to the full. So we, we can extend that to sort of say that the supremum, um, so of the um, errors over, like over all points, um, by just adding a little kind of term that accounts for the fact that we have some kind of Lipschitz bound on our um, on our kernel. Uh, this will give us. This will essentially give us a probabilistic bound on. The, uh, on the era of of our the, the, uh, like like of our discretization applied to a specific function, and then you know we can choose psi to be really really small, like you know of the order of c or something like this, so that we can make this all work out. Um, you know we, we we can essentially yeah get some kind of probabilistic bound on this norm as opposed to um, we say you know get some like bound on like the distribution of this um, of this error. And so usually what that means is because you have this kind of, you know, e to the minus something, something c squared, um, whereas psi, so you have an exponential decay in c um, on the right hand side here, but only a sort of polynomial growth in um, with respect to psi, you can sort of just basically you get what you want with like a sort of small log term, like with, with a loss of a log term in error. Uh, and we kind of want to do this for the operator norm, but it's kind of harder because uh, because I guess function spaces aren't compact. Uh, so you need a function. So you need to have a strong function space which embeds compactly into, um, say, C zero um, space of continuous functions. Um, and the reason we should yeah, 
um, I should just say the reason we choose the space of continuous functions um, is because it has the same norm as L infinity, so we can do maxima, but um, it's possible to actually evaluate. Um, you, you know, you, you, you can actually evaluate a function at a given point, uh, which you can't do in L infinity. Um, yeah, but we need this kind of, we need a strong space inside C0, and this strong space should contain really the image of these, um, of these kernel operators. Uh, so if, if we have for our Gaussian kernel, uh, we can probably choose like most function spaces because the Gaussian, you know, the, the Gaussian is very, very smooth. Uh, and in particular, uh, the space of functions that we are going to choose are essentially Hardy spaces. So these are spaces of um, complex, uh, complex analytic functions. And we're going to make these, we're actually going to choose a different Hardy space for every different time step epsilon. Um, essentially, so we're going to look at functions that are analytic on a sort of very small strip, a thin strip about um, a sort of in, in the complex plane, sort of about our domain. Uh, and when I mean a thin strip, I mean you look, say, order of root epsilon away from your actual strip, from your actual domain, your sort of real domain D. And like, so this is kind of a root epsilon fattening. Um, you like that that will be our domain and our functions need to be you know c0 and analytic um and this diagram here kind of tells you like what they look like so essentially yeah they're kind of on a on a sort of scale of root order root epsilon uh, in the real uh, along the real line they're kind of smooth they're kind of very, they're very nice they're nicely behaved but then they can kind of do complete wildly different things at different parts of the space and you can sort of imagine uh that if you take a, and in fact, the way that the reason they're kind of useful is that if you take a smooth function, um, so if you, if you take a sort of very rough function, like something that's L infinity, or maybe even in a sort of slightly worse space, um, and you apply a convolution by a Gaussian of, you know, variance epsilon, you're going to get functions that look kind of like this. Uh, and in fact, the norm, um, yeah, so you, this kind of nice norm, um, embedding here of this convolution operator, which turns up in our kernel operator. Um, it turns out that, uh, <coughs> that the kind of covering number, the number of, you know, the, the number of balls you need to sort of cover your unit, the number of C0 balls you need to cover the unit ball of this Hardy space, um, which is what we need, it's kind of a bit like um, where we were doing the sort of extension to a function norm, um, it turns out you need this number of um, balls. And this is kind of, this is kind of some level, if epsilon was equal to one, this would be good because it would mean that we have in our kind of union bound, uh, like here, um, no, hang on, not like that. Sorry, like here, you, you, you sort of get an e to the log psi or something, which will balance out against this c, so minus c squared. But if epsilon is only equal to one, then this comes at causes a problem because we have this e to the minus, epsilon to the minus d on two, which is balancing out against our c squared. So that really blows up the kind of, the, like, like essentially we're gonna have to, we, we, we're not gonna get our just nice MF scaling. We're gonna have something that depends on epsilon to the d. Um, however, and this is where a lot of the, like sort of Glevin Cocantelli arguments kind of give, like end up with quite bad convergence in epsilon, uh, but, I guess the kind of innovation is that we can use here, like in this work, is that you can, we can use the fact that our kernel operator is in fact very localized. Um, so I guess what that means is if you take a, you know, the, if, if you look at say KM epsilon of some function phi at a given point X, it's really only going to depend on values of phi like quite close to X and an order root epsilon neighborhood. So we can actually approximate, you know, KM phi of X, um, say just by looking at phi restricted to some kind of slightly bigger than root epsilon neighborhood of our um of a slightly bigger than order root epsilon neighborhood of our um of, of the point x and on this neighborhood we're going to get much nicer covering numbers essentially because um if you look at this picture everything has to be there's sort of less opportunity for kind of variation in our function. Um, so the kind of upshot of this is, I mean, if you put this all together, um, 
if you sort of take this idea and put, it, put everything together, we get essentially this kind of bound here where you can see that the probability of the operator, the, the, the operator error um, is being greater than C is essentially the, the, the point-wise error that we got uh, with this MF C squared uh, plus some terms that are just logs essentially. So if you sort of make C a little bit bigger than it otherwise would have been, um, then you will get the kind of error that you want. Um, So in, in particular, um, I mean, if we, if we go from epsilon, instead of thinking about epsilon, we think about epsilon to the, on to the, on, the epsilon on two, you get that this kind of norm tends to be, yeah, essentially this kind of MF to the minus a half, which is the central limit theorem, uh, times some log terms. Uh, I guess the reason that we're going to talk about epsilon on, I've sort of just like brought up, that we're, going, that we're going to talk about epsilon on two, uh, because we actually, for the Gaussian kernel, we're actually kind of lucky because it's divisible. So we can write uh, this KM epsilon, which is this nasty finite rank, you know, kind of discretized operator where you look at the pointwise thing is in fact the same thing over a shorter time step times a convolution. Uh, so where we had a sort of strong, strong space to weak space kind of convergence here, uh, for this kind of thing, we can actually say, well, this is strong space to weak space, but then this, because it's convolution by a Gaussian, so that will send it to a very strong space. This is a, this is a weak space to strong space result. Converge, like this will, is bounded from a weak space to a strong space. And so our actual operator error, our bias, like the, the operator error is in fact bounded within a single space, this kind of weird hardy space, um, essentially by, yeah, by, by this delta parameter, which is this norm. Uh, which is of order mf to the minus a half. Um, and so this kind of essentially, I guess, wraps up the treatment of the variance uh, of, of this kind of particle discretization um, because we can deal with, like as long as we're happy to work in this like Hardy space, we can actually deal with everything just by looking at, we can sort of bound all our errors just by looking at this delta term, uh, by looking at the size of delta. And so hopefully, we well, probably won't really yet, with the synchron um, errors, it, it just like we have, you have this kind of complex nonlinear problem with this kind of implicitly defined um, weights that depend on some problem depending on the case. And it really just kind of, you can just use the implicit function theorem to make it all work. And even though you have this kind of horrible random particle discretization, it, it, all, still, it all still goes through. Um, right, yeah, so I mean, for the sort of kind of standard operators, we just need to consider the convergence of these things. Um, and then I guess the norm convergence gives you that everything's order delta, and in particular our operator error is order delta. Um, so that kind of gives us every, all our results we need for the variance error. Uh, for the bias error, we have, okay, so we need to compare our continuum limit P epsilon uh, to the, I guess, the kind of semi-group, e to the epsilon L. Except, uh, right, um, except actually um, it's going to be more useful for us to compare P epsilon to the power of N where N is of order one in the time step. So essentially, um, and the same thing for the semi-group. Uh, and I guess the reason for that is we want to, if we want to consider the convergence of the spectrum as we take something to zero, um, we'd like, because we take, yeah, it's this problem of like e to the epsilon l goes to the identity as epsilon goes to zero. So we'd like to actually converge to something that is um, not the, you know, not, not sort of in some sense very singular. Uh, so yeah, we're just going to make it, make them, make them run for long, just look at iterates essentially. Um, now the nice thing about these is they're both Markov operators. Uh, and furthermore, uh, like our sort of continuum limit um, bias error, the uh, operator has the bias error in it, um, is in fact can be written as not just the Markov operator, but some sort of weighted version of this kind of exponential or like of this sort of diffusion semi group. So, I mean, this is just, I mean, it's a convolution by a Gaussian, but on the flat surface, that is in fact a, you know, an evolution operator of a diffusion. Um, so, it turns out that if we then sort of, you know, do the standard kind of um, uh, SDE. 
sort of re, re, re weighting, um, we can think of P epsilon uh, to the power of n um, as a sort of evolution operator over PDE. Um, and also the same, for, I mean, obviously the same for the um, semi-group. So for the semi-group, it's, um, it's just the evolution operator of the, um, of the Laplace Beltrami operator. But for, the, um, for this P epsilon, it's in fact the evolution operator of, well, I guess a diffusion plus a drift. Uh, and if we extend it um, sort of through time, so we just keep doing iterates of it, uh, we get we sort of have a drift that is epsilon periodic. So it's sort of like, um, you know, it's sort of drift, yeah, the, the, the drift is kind of periodic in time. And um, in particular, because, I mean, this drift term here with this sort of e to the epsilon, e to the t times delta on two times rho u epsilon, um, if, I mean, if, if epsilon is very small, and this is always going to be very close to just rho u epsilon, uh, which itself, if, it, if epsilon is small, is going to be close to rho to the minus one on alpha plus or epsilon, uh, because u epsilon is just a kernel density estimate of, um, of rho to the minus alpha, um, as we saw it defined um, originally. Uh, and all we saw that defined for you for like the, the vector u, but then this is a continuum limit. Uh, so because of this, we find that this, like this drift term is order epsilon close to like grad of log rho to the, to the one on alpha. And so we end up getting an error term that is if we sort of look at, you know, look at the difference of two operator of two evolution operators, um, you can show that going from a sort of strong space, which now is not, it's not hardy space, it's a C two plus beta, so to hold the space um, into C0, we find that this error is going to be order epsilon um, for this n scaling. And so this, this would hold for rho being, you know, like having a sort of reasonably nice regularity, but in fact, we can sort of play around with sort of the world of um, <laughs> negative lab, sort of, yeah, negative Sobolev spaces uh, and show that in fact, we can get it to work for rho, which is like not even C2, uh, which is, I guess, a nice result, perhaps. Um, this all plays, so, so really what we've done for the bias error and the variance error is we've shown that some like operator errors, so essentially, yeah, op, that we've shown some convergence of the operators um, that we're associating uh, diffusion maps to, but then we, I mean, of course, we want to show that the um, spectral rates will, like the, the spectral data will converge uh, and this is just, I mean, so the way we did it was just really quite standard. Um, uh, yeah, operator approximation stuff. We know that our operators are regularized, at least our sort of semi-group and the sort of continuum limit are very regularizing. Um, they will send you from some bad space, you know, L infinity, L1, whatever, into some very nice space if you let them run over an order one time. Um, we sort of have some a priori bounds on the resolvent of our semi-group. Um, because it's, you know, it, it, it's L2, it's orthogonal, so the resolvent, the norm of the resolvent just depends on how far you are away from the spectrum. Uh, and you can then use these two things, plus the fact we have these like strong to weak operator convergence estimates to get bounds on the norm of the resolvent, which will then tell you things about the eigenvalues and the eigenfunctions. Um, with a little bit of playing around with the fact that you have these hardy spaces for the variance error, at least kind of, C2 spaces for the, um, uh, for, the, for, the, for the bias error. Uh, you put, could probably use Rayleigh quotients here instead, and it might be possible if you play around with the variance error to get some sort of slightly better results. Um, but basically the idea is you get um, spectral convergence, you get this kind of order MF to the minus a half, um, with then blown up by, which is the point wise variance error, blown up by epsilon to the minus one because of the short time step. Um, and then the same thing, the same idea for the pointwise bias error times epsilon to minus one. Um, we, so yeah, I mean, this is, the bias error is definitely optimal, is optimal. Um, I think later I've got a graph that shows that. Uh, the, variance S, um, the variance error is, um, it's correct with respect to M. So, I mean, here we have on the bottom right here, um, you can see that there are, so you want to look at the dotted lines actually, but the, the, the full lines are basically the same. You can see that you get convergence, um, central limit theorem style convergence in the order of um, M. So this is for the um, 
eigenvectors, uh, and you can see that. But as you change epsilon, you actually get kind of slower behavior. Like you, you get better, you get better behavior than you expect um, for the epsilon uh, in the variance. Uh, yeah. Uh, which is kind of nice. I mean, it, it's obviously not the end. There's a small improvement that someone that, that you could make uh, that would be quite. I mean, I think they have some some ideas about how how that might happen. Um, I, it's an interesting question, but more or less, like up to some small polynomial term in epsilon, uh, it's more or less this is sort of about about right, which is quite nice. Um, but yeah. So I don't know if we really have much time, but maybe I'll try and just say a little bit about the synchron weights. Um, so I guess one motivation for this you could say is, well, let's see what we can do with this kind of, um, with this very nice operator convergence results that we have that will, you know, like should let us do lots and lots of things. Um, another way you could kind of motivate this is say, well, what happens if we try to make our diffusion maps uh, normalization symmetric. So um, we picked basically u uh, right hand normalization vector b equal to v, which is the thing we need to make to do to make Markov. So you get this, that's what our matrix would look like. Um, if this thing meant anything, like was anything meaningful, then well, I guess we have, we like it would, because it's symmetric, um, it would have orthogonal eigenfunctions. So in some sense, it's doing a real like uh, nonlinear kind of PCA. Um, and it also has the few nice behavior properties that like total integral and constant functions are preserved, which could be useful for forecasting. Um, I don't know. I kind of interested, like, yeah, interested to see what kinds of things you could do with this. Um, but essentially, I mean, you run into this, like theoretically you run into this kind of um, nonlinear problem where you, to actually compute the weight you, you have to show, you, you want essentially this to hold. And the reason you want this to hold is because u is, I guess, well, u is equal to v, which is equal to one over k u. Um, in function space, it looks like this. Um, and right, so I guess we just, if we want to show this, okay, yeah. So I mean, the the great thing about variance error is the the sort of theoretic the theory we have about the variance error is we can relate this to a continuum limit, um, which will obviously solve the continuum version of this. Uh, just by using the implicit function theorem. And so we get this kind of nice behavior here. Um, I mean, if, yeah. Um, I haven't said how you actually compute these weights, but they, they, do, uh, you, they do exist and you do it using so-called synchron iteration. Um, the way that the u epsilons work is, um, okay, so I mean, we kind of need to know what the continuum limit looks like um, because we have the synchron problem which essentially says that, I mean, yeah, like u epsilon times sort of slightly, slightly diffused version of the weight times rho is equal to one. We can sort of assume that as epsilon goes to zero, we get this convergence to rho to one half, uh, which is going to tell us, in fact, quite nicely that uh, um, as we take that our diffusion maps kind of idea is going to converge to a Langevin diffusion because this is the precise uh, weight that you're approximating well, like this rho to the minus a half, the half corresponds to alpha. Uh, so we, yeah, we're going to get a Langevin diffusion. Um, and in particular, I guess a nice property of this actual synchron um, behavior is that the um, invariant measure of it is in fact a constant function on the um, sample points. So it's, yeah, the invariant measure is just the measure of the, um, this is, this is the empirical measure of the sample points. Of, of the sample xi. So you'll see, if you do a random walk for a very long time, you'll see every point are the same number of, like evenly, essentially. Um, it's a bit hard to, pr like proving this is not so easy, the fact that it is, does converge to rho to the, rho to the minus a half. Uh, and essentially, I mean, for synchron heads uh, in the audience, uh, you sort of have to, you can show it by writing synchron iteration, like in this continuum limit, as a sort of nonlinear PDE and doing averaging results on it. Um, it turns out one really nice thing about this kind of synchron method, I guess, is that it actually has a, the bias error is actually improved from order epsilon to order epsilon squared. Uh, and essentially the reason for this uh, comes out of the symmetry of the, um, 
comes out of the symmetry of the uh, of, of yeah the fact that you get a symmetric operator, um, the symmetry of the problem. So you, I mean, again, it's the same idea as before. You have these two. You can write it as these two PDEs, um, and now we can actually. It turns out we can actually write um, the approximate this um, uh, the second PDE, which is the one for the P and epsilon, um, because it is because you have this kind of if you, if you just think about it acting over like lots of different, um, like, you know, multiple iterates of your P and epsilon. So if you're, if you're P epsilon, um, you kind of have this, you, you look at the drift and it kind of oscillates um, over cycles. And the thing about the synchron weight is if you, so you can kind of do some averaging over it. If you have a start with an initial function, like if, you, if, you, if your input function, your phi is of high enough regularity, um, yeah, you can you can approximate this kind of rapidly varying function by some constant function, which is just an average over the over a period of this rapidly varying function. Um, and if you do that, you find that well, if you just take a approximate this integral um, by by a trape by the trapezoidal rule, um, this here is essentially your drift your lo the log of your um, right if you if you kind of diffused rho u epsilon. Um, at the end point, which is in fact, this is just V epsilon, um, which is, oh, so one on V epsilon rather, which is um, one on U epsilon. And then this is log of rho plus log of U epsilon. So these two will cancel out and you get, because of the symmetry, and so you'll end up with an average, which is log of rho, um, which is obviously precisely the drift that you want here. Uh, and so it turns out you indeed do get higher order convergence of your um, bias error. And if you sort of do a little bit of operator expansion, you can show that this is actually the best asymptotic rate. So you can't get order epsilon cubed um, unless you have, unless your density is, is a constant density. Um, and again, with the cell love space argument, we can make sure, that we can show that this works for rho really only slightly more than C2, um, which is quite nice because like averaging is obviously this quite high order um, behavior. And so here we tried it for you know rho equals c to two minus two or some low so c c two point two, um, so some wire stress function, and you can see that the standard error, uh, which is the dotted lines, uh, the dashed lines rather, converges at order epsilon, but then the synchron error does better. In practice, it's not very used. It's like it's you you really need to have a lot of data points to be able to for like reasonably high dimensions to be able to to see much of a difference here. I mean, if you if you did have a really sort of large saturation of data, you would it would be useful. Uh, like this would make a sort of quite substantial difference. Um, uh, I think, yeah, I, I think a lot of the like what really makes Synchron kind of better is that it has this formal behavior of being self-adjoint and preserving constant functions and so on. Oh, preserving total integral. Um, and in fact, I mean, I guess. It's, there's a really nice, we also came up with this really nice um, algorithm to compute the synchron weights. Um, usually you would use so-called synchron iteration, which basically uses the fact that it's a fixed point of this kind of iteration. Um, but the Jacobian of this iteration is very slow because, K, I mean, if you take epsilon to be very small, it's like a very small diffusion. And so you're kind of just essentially applying a very small diffusion. Uh, so it takes a long time, but if you, use the fact that it kind of bounces around, then you can make it work. Yeah, you can sort of play around with it um, and you can make it convert, converge like uniformly, no matter what kind of what kind of sort of matrix you've been given it, you've given it this K, uh, you can make it work, um, converge sort of basically at the same rate um, as A to the minus N, so it really, but essentially, computing the synchron um, weights is as easy, almost as computing standard weights. So, if you want to do, if you want to sort of simulate Langevin diffusions on data point on, on data samples, uh, this is absolutely the best way to do it, um, and uh, you should use it. Uh, which is not something that I think people had really um, done before or really investigated. So. Uh, yeah, I guess Zincon, very good, very um, 
potentially very useful if you want to do that. Um, so I suppose I should wrap up. Uh, so essentially what we've shown is that um, essentially um, like near, near optimal bounds uh, on the spectral convergence rates of diffusion maps. So the difference is probably something like order epsilon to the one on 1.5. Um, although it should be said that this is just for Gaussian kernels uh, on flat domains. Uh, flat domains are probably easier to fix here than Gaussian kernels. Um, but I think, I mean, they're both, um, but I mean, nonetheless, like people haven't really been able to do it like this robustly, even for Gaussian kernels. So um, that's a sort of a win. Um, and the way in particular, I mean, the way we've done this is by using these, by essentially um, showing operator convergence of these quite, um, of these sort of random, of the random data discretization, sorry, random data discretizations, which um, previously people haven't really been able to sort of treat in a very, um, in a very robust way. Uh, and so this should, I mean, even outside of diffusion maps, this should allow, or even outside of sort of computing spectral data, this should really be quite applicable to lots of different um, areas, uh, which hopefully we'll sort of see. Um, and in particular, I guess, one area that we sort of applied, looked at here was sort of looking at sinkhole normalizations. Um, and it turned out that this was a very, this, this turns out to be a much better choice or a significantly somewhat better choice, um, depending on your regime, um, to simulate Langevin dynamics on a sort of point sample um, compared with the sort of usual way that people have done it before. So this is all sort of summarized in this archive paper. Well, not summarized, this is all expounded at length in an archive paper, uh, which you can uh, read there if you so desire.